Arkansas Connections. A chart that appeared in the Progressive Review, May 1992. The media tried to turn the Clinton story into Camelot, too. Just the truth would have made life easier for all of us. And a much better tale as well. Sam Smith. Copyright 1998 The Progressive Review. Updated January 2001 and periodically thereafter. 1950s. When Bill Clinton is seven, his family moves from Hope, Arkansas, to the longtime mob resort of Hot Springs, Arkansas. Here Al Capone is said to have had permanent rights to Suite 443 of the Arlington Hotel. Clinton's stepfather is a gun-brandishing alcoholic who loses his Buick franchise through mismanagement and his own pilfering. He physically abuses his family, including the young Bill. His mother is a heavy gambler with mob ties. According to FBI and local police officials, his uncle Raymond, to whom young Bill turns for wisdom and support, is a colorful car dealer, slot machine owner and gambling operator, who thrives, except when his house is firebombed, on the fault line of criminality. Paul Bosson, Hot Springs prosecutor, in Hot Springs, growing up here, you were living a lie. You lived a lie because you knew that all of these activities were illegal. I mean, as soon as you got old enough to be able to read a newspaper, you knew that gambling in Arkansas was illegal, prostitution was illegal. And so you lived this lie, so you have to find some way to justify that to yourself and, you know, you justify it by saying, well, you know, it's okay here. Virginia Kelly, Clinton's mother, 1923-1994, Hot Springs was so different. We had wide open gambling, for one thing, and it was so wide open that it never occurred to me that it was illegal, it really didn't, until it came to a vote about whether we were going to legalize gambling or not. I never was so shocked. Hot Springs Before the Clintons In the 1930s, Hot Springs represented the western border of organized crime in the U.S. with a local syndicate headed by Oney Madden, a New York killer who had taken over the mob's resort in Arkansas. Oney Madden was an English-born gang member who had been arrested more than 40 times in New York by the time he was 21. Madden got the assignment from his boss, Meyer Lansky. The plan for Arkansas was modeled on an earlier one in which Governor Huey Long opened a Swiss bank account into which the mob would put $3 to $4 million annually for the right to run casinos in the state. Lansky then moved to Hot Springs where he hired Madden former operator of Harlem's Cotton Club. According to one account, the Hot Springs setup was so luxurious and safe that it became known as a place for gangsters on the lam to hole up until the heat blew over. Hot Springs was where Lucky Luciano was arrested and brought back for trial prosecuted by Thomas E. Dewey. According to one account, Dewey proclaimed Luciano public enemy no one, and a grand jury returned a criminal indictment against him that carried a maximum penalty of 1,950 years. He was arrested in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and extradited back to New York. There, in the New York State Supreme Court he was tried, and on June 7, the verdict of guilty was returned. Eleven days later, he was sentenced to a total of from 30 to 50 years in state prison. It was the longest sentence ever handed out for compulsory prostitution. The Dice Man There is evidence that many syndicate groups became involved in Hot Springs. Only Madden was the overseer of everything and watched out for the New York mob's interests. Morris Kleinman, who was one of the founding gangsters of the Cleveland Syndicate spent much time in Hot Springs. It is rumored that the Cleveland boys had pieces of the profits from Hot Springs gambling. Johnny Rosselli an upper-level member of the Chicago mob was a silent partner in many Hot Springs casinos in the 1940s and 1950s, as was Frank Costello. All of these groups used local operators as fronts, a system perfected by the Cleveland Syndicate in Ohio, Florida, and Kentucky. Since Hot Springs was a very popular tourist spot, the command went out from the different syndicates that there should be no murders carried out in Hot Springs. This would be the rule in Las Vegas too. If bodies littered the streets like in Chicago, it would only hurt business. Also petty crimes like burglary and armed robbery were not to be tolerated. If the suckers weren't comfortable, they wouldn't come to hot springs. 
Oni Madden laid the groundwork for gangsters on the lam to hide out in hot springs. The city had a resort-like atmosphere and elegant nightlife, with people coming and going all the time. This was the perfect situation to hide mobsters who couldn't be seen in their hometowns. Al Capone would stay at the Arlington Hotel when things got too hot in Chicago. 1960s A federal investigation concludes that Hot Springs has the largest illegal gambling operations in the United States. Clinton goes to Georgetown University where he finds a mentor and professor Carol Quigley. Quigley writes, that the two political parties should represent opposed ideals and policies. Is a foolish idea. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical. The policies that are vital and necessary for America are no longer subjects of significant disagreement, but are disputable only in detail, procedure, priority, or method. Bill Clinton, according to several agency sources interviewed by biographer Roger Morris, works as a CIA informer while briefly and erratically a Rhodes Scholar in England. Although without visible means of support, he travels around Europe and the Soviet Union, staying at the Ritziest Hotel in Moscow. During this period the U.S. government is using well-educated assets such as Clinton as part of Operation Chaos, a major attempt to break student resistance to the war in the draft. According to former White House FBI agent Gary Aldrich Clinton is told by Oxford officials that he is no longer welcome there. Bill Clinton and his friend Jim McDougall get a job in the office of Senator J. William Fulbright. The Washington Post will later write, McDougall was interested in making money while Clinton was obsessed with political stature. After becoming involved in politics, Wellesley graduate Hillary Rodham will order her senior thesis sealed from public view. 1969. Bill Clinton fails to report to his duty station at the University of Arkansas ROTC. Reclassified 1A on October 30, 1969, as enlistment with Army Reserves is revoked by Colonel Lee Holmes. 1974. 27-year-old Clinton, only months out of Yale Law School, is back in Arkansas eager to run for Congress. Roger Morris writes later, a relative unknown. He faces an imposing field of rivals in the Democratic primary, and beyond, in the general election, a powerful Republican incumbent. Yet as soon as he enters the race, Mr. Clinton enjoys a decisive 7 to 1 advantage in campaign funds over the nearest Democratic competitor, and will spend twice as much as his well-supported GOP opponent. It begins with a quiet meeting at his mother's house in Hot Springs. Around the kitchen table, as Virginia Clinton will describe the scene, avid young Billy meets with two of his most crucial early backers, Uncle Raymond G. Clinton, a prosperous local Buick dealer, and family friend and wealthy businessman Gabe Crawford. As they talk, Mr. Crawford offers the candidate unlimited use of his private plane, and Uncle Raymond not only provides several houses around the district to serve as campaign headquarters, but will secure a $10,000 loan to Bill from the First National Bank of Hot Springs, an amount then equal to the yearly income of many Arkansas families. Together, the money and aircraft and other gifts, including thousands more in secret donations, will launch Mr. Clinton in the most richly financed race in the annals of Arkansas, and ultimately onto the most richly financed political career in American history. Though he loses narrowly, his showing is so impressive especially in his capacity to attract such money and favors, that he rises rapidly to become state attorney general, then governor, and eventually, with much the same backing and advantage, president of the United States. No mere businessman with a spare plane, Gabe Crawford presided over a backroom bookie operation that was one of Hot Springs' most lucrative criminal enterprises. And the, inimitable Uncle Raymond who had also played a pivotal behind-the-scenes role in keeping young Bill out of the Vietnam draft, was far more than an auto dealer. In the nationally prominent found of vice and corruption that was Hot Springs from the 1920s to the 1980s, its barely concealed casinos generated more income than Las Vegas well into the 1960s, the Uncle's Buick Agency and other businesses and real estate were widely thought to be facades for legal gambling drug money laundering and other ventures, in which Raymond was a partner. He was a minion of the organized crime overlord who controlled the American Middle South for decades, 
New Orleans boss Carlos Marcelo or Mafia Kingfish as his biographer John Davis called him. 1976. Bill Clinton is elected Attorney General of Arkansas. Two Indonesian millionaires come to Arkansas. Mokta Riyadi and Liam Sai Lyon are close to Sihardo. Riyadi is looking for an American bank to buy. Finds Jackson Stevens with whom he formed Stevens Finance. Stevens will broker the arrival of BCCI to this country and steer BCCI's founder, Hassan Abedi, to Birdlands. Riyadi's teenage son is taken on as an intern by Stevens Incorporated. He later says he was sponsored by Bill Clinton. 1977 Hillary Clinton joins the Rose Law Firm. Apparently because of pressure from Indonesia, Riyadi withdraws his bid to buy Lance's 30% share of the National Bank of Georgia. Instead, a BCCI frontman buys the shares and Abedi moves to secretly take over Financial General, later First American Bank shares, later the subject of the only BCCI-connected scandal to be prosecuted in the U.S. 1978 Clinton is elected governor. The Clintons and McDougals buy land in the Ozarks for $203,000 with mostly borrowed funds. The Clintons get 50% interest with no cash down. The 203-acre plot, known as Wine Water, is 50 miles from the nearest grocery store. The Washington Post will report later that some purchasers of lots, many of them retirees, put up houses or cabins, others slept in vans or tents, hoping to be able to live off the land. More than half of the purchasers will lose their plots thanks to the sleazy form of financing used. Two months after commencing the Whitewater scam, Hillary Clinton invests $1,000 in cattle futures. Within a few days she has a $5,000 profit. Before bailing out she earns nearly $100,000 on her investment. Many years later, several economists will calculate that the chances of earning such returns legally were 1 in 250 million. Governor Clinton appoints Jim McDougal an economic development advisor. Bill Clinton's mother hangs out at the racetrack with mobsters and other local figures, including Dan Lassader who breeds racehorses in Kentucky and Florida and has a box at the track next to hers. Mrs. Clinton introduces Lassader to Roger Clinton. More than a few Little Rock insiders believe Hillary Clinton is having an affair with Vince Foster. Roger Clinton develops a 4 gram a day cocaine habit, getting his stuff from New York and Medellin suppliers, based as one middleman will later testify, on who his brother was. Charlene Wilson is one of his dealers. Dan Lassader will give Roger work and loan him $8,000 to pay off a drug debt. Juanita Broderick, a volunteer in Clinton's gubernatorial campaign, will later claim she was attacked by by Clinton and her lip almost bitten off. According to Roger Morse in Partners in Power, a young woman lawyer in Little Rock will later claim that she was accosted by Clinton this year and that when she recoiled he forced himself on her, biting and bruising her. Deeply affected by the assault, the woman decided to keep it all quiet for the sake of her own hard-won career and that of her husband. When the husband later saw Clinton at the 1980 Democratic Convention, he delivered a warning. If you ever approach her, he told the governor, I'll kill you. Not even seeing fit to deny the incident, Bill Clinton sheepishly apologized and duly promised never to bother her again. 1979 Charlene Wilson will testify in a 1990 federal drug probe that she began selling cocaine to Roger Clinton as early as this year. She will also tell reporters that she sold two grams of cocaine to Clinton's brother at the Little Rock nightclub La Bistro, then witnessed Bill Clinton consume the drug. I watched Bill Clinton lean up against a brick wall, Wilson reveals to the London Telegraph's Ambrose Evans Pritchard in 1995. He was so messed up that night, he slid down the wall into a garbage can and just sat there like a complete idiot. Wilson also describes gatherings at Little Rock's Coachman's in between 1979 and 1981, where she saw Clinton using cocaine quite avidly with friends. Drug prosecutor Jean Duffy will say that she has no doubt that Wilson was telling the truth. The Clintons and McDougals form Whitewater Development Company. 1980s Governor Clinton appoints Webb Hubble to head a new state ethics commission. First task, 
to weaken ethics legislation currently under consideration by exempting the governor from some of its most rigorous provisions. Arkansas becomes a major center of gun running, drugs and money laundering. The IRS warns other law enforcement agencies of the state's enticing climate. According to Clinton biographer Roger Morris, operatives go into banks with duffel bags full of cash, which bank officers then distribute to tellers in sums under $10,000 so they don't have to report the transaction. Charlene Wilson, according to investigative reporter Ambrose Evans Pritchard, flies cocaine from to a pickup point in Texas. Other drugs she and others say, are stuffed into chickens for shipping around the country. Wilson also serves as the lady with the snow at toga parties attended, she reports, by Bill Clinton. According to Wilson, I lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, okay? And I worked at a club called the Bistros, and I met Roger Clinton there, Governor Bill Clinton, a couple of his state troopers that went with him wherever he went. Roger Clinton had come up to me and he had asked me could I give him some coke, you know, and asked for my one-hitter, which a one-hitter is a very small silver device, okay, that you stick up into your nose and you just squeeze it and a snort of cocaine will go up in their dot and I watched Roger hand what I had given him to Governor Clinton, and he just kind of turned around and walked off. Investors Business Daily would later write, Sally Perdue a former Miss Arkansas and Little Rock talk show host who said she had an affair with then Gov. Clinton in 1983, told the London Sunday Telegraph that he once came over to her house with a bag full of cocaine. He had all the equipment laid out, like a real pro. In the 1990s, Jennifer Flowers tells Sean Hannity's WAP talk radio show, he smoked marijuana in my presence and and offered me the opportunity to snort cocaine if I wanted to. I wasn't into that. Bill clearly let me know that he did cocaine. And I know people that knew he did cocaine. He did tell me that when he would use a substantial amount of cocaine that his head would itch so badly that he would become self-conscious at parties where he was doing this. Because all he wanted to do while people were talking to him is stand around and scratch his head. Two Arkansas state troopers will swear under oath that they have seen Clinton under the influence of drugs when he was governor. Charlene Wilson is a bartender who ended up serving time on drug crimes and cooperating with drug investigators. She told a federal grand jury she saw Clinton and his younger brother snort cocaine together in 1979. Jack McCoy, a Democratic state representative and Clinton supporter, told the Sunday Telegraph that he could remember going into the governor's conference room once and it reeked of marijuana. Historian Roger Morris, in his book Partners in Power, Quotes several law enforcement officials who say they had seen and knew of Clinton's drug use. One time apartment manager Jane Parks claims that in 1984 she could listen through the wall as Bill and Roger Clinton, in a room adjoining hers, discuss the quality of the drugs they were taking. Hillary Clinton makes a $44,000 profit on a $2,000 investment in a cellular phone franchise deal that involves taking advantage of the FCC's preference for locals, minorities and women. The franchise is almost immediately flipped to the cellular giant, Mika. A drug pilot brings a Cessna 210 full of cocaine into eastern Arkansas where he is met by his pickup, a state trooper in a marked police car. Arkansas the pilot will recall years later, was a very good place to load and unload. Vince Foster According to his wife, security operative Jerry Parks delivers large sums of money from Meenan Airport to Vince Foster at a Kmart parking lot. Mrs. Parks discovers this when she opens her car trunk one day and finds so much cash that she has to sit on the trunk to close it again. She asks her husband whether he is dealing drugs and he allegedly explains that Foster paid him $1,000 for each trip he took to Mina. Parks said he didn't know what they were doing, and he didn't care to know. He told me to forget what I'd seen. Later Evans Pritchard will write, Foster was using him as a kind of operative to collect sensitive information on things and do sensitive jobs. Some of this appears to have been done on behalf of Hillary Clinton. Foster told him that Hillary wanted it done. Now. My understanding is that she wanted to know how vulnerable he would be in a presidential race on the question of, how shall I put it, his appetites.
Hillary Clinton quietly lobbies on behalf of the Contras and against groups and individuals opposing them. Dan Lasseter's parties become known around Little Rock for the availability of cocaine and women. Judy Gubbs, a model and call girl who appeared in Penthouse magazine, runs a powerful house of prostitution in Four Dice with her sister Sharon. They also blackmail some of their more powerful clients. Both her family and one of Clinton's bodyguards will later link Judy Gibbs to the governor. She decides to cooperate with police in an investigation of Arkansas cocaine trafficking, but is burned to death inside her home from a fire of undetermined origin. In 1999, Newsmax will report, former Clinton bodyguard Barry, Spivy had become something of a mystery man, who insisted on meeting, Paula Jones investigator. Rick Lambert on a deserted road nestled deep in the Arkansas backwoods. The Jones investigator admitted he was none too comfortable with the situation. Spivy shared a story about a conversation he had with Clinton while on a flight over southeast Arkansas. The trooper noticed a blackened patch amidst the greenery below that, surprisingly, Clinton recognized. That patch was all that was left of an estate that had burned to the ground in the mid-80s. According to the trooper, Clinton began reminiscing about rumors of his involvement with the woman of the house, a one-time penthouse pet. Her husband, Spivy said, was involved in a pornography ring. Clinton explained to Spivy, you know that mansion just burned down right on top of them. Years later, Spivy remains struck by one thing, the eerie expression that crossed Clinton's face as he spoke those words. The sudden and or violent deaths of persons connected in some way to the Clinton machine have been at best shoddily investigated by public officials. It is impossible in many cases to determine which are the result of foul play and which are coincidental. Barbara Wise is a case in point. This woman, whose partially nude body was found in the Commerce Department, has been described by some as being a highly disturbed person whose death may be totally unrelated to the Clinton scandals. In cases of foul play, readers are warned not to leap to conclusions as to motivation or potential perpetrators. For example, if Vincent Foster was killed rather than committing suicide, it may not have been because of the shady dealings at the White House but because public investigations of these shady dealings threatened to expose peripheral criminality such as past money laundering, drug trafficking, or illegal intelligence activities. 1980 Bill Clinton loses re-election as governor. He will win two years later. Larry Nichols will tell The George Putman Show in 1998 that he had met with Clinton and Jackson Stevens' brother Witt and that Witt had told Clinton that the Stevens were ready to back him for another run at the governorship but that he had to dry out on the wide stuff. There are reports that following his loss, Clinton ended up in the hospital for a drug overdose. Journalist R. Emmett Tyrrell later asked emergency room workers at the University of Arkansas Medical Center if they could confirm the incident. He didn't get a flat no from the hospital staff. One nurse said, I can't talk about that. Another said she feared for her life if she spoke of the matter. News Maxwell Report, Dr. Sam Houston, a respected Little Rock physician and once a doctor for Hillary's cantankerous father, Hugh Rodham says it is well known in Little Rock medical circles that Clinton was brought to a Little Rock hospital for emergency treatment for an apparent cocaine overdose. According to Houston, who told us he spoke to someone intimately familiar with the details of what happened that night, Clinton arrived at the hospital with the aid of a state trooper. Hillary Clinton had been notified by phone and had instructed the hospital staff that Clinton's personal physician would be arriving soon. When Mrs. Clinton arrived, she told both of the resident physicians on duty that night that they would never practice medicine in the United States if word leaked out about Clinton's drug problem. Reportedly, she pinned one of the doctors up against the wall, both hands pressed against his shoulders, as she gave her dire warning. According to Jim McDougall's later account, he and Henry Hamilton developed a system to pass money to Clinton, then governor of Arkansas. I considered it just another way of helping to take care of Bill. A contractor agreed to pad my monthly construction bill by $2,000. The contractor put the figure on his invoice as a cost for gravel or culvert work. After I paid the full amount, the contractor reimbursed me the $2,000. I turned the money over to Henry to give to Clinton. Once, 
after I handed Henry his latest consignment of twenty hundred dollar bills to relay to the governor's office, he turned the bills over and over in one hand, like a magician. Henry grinned. You know, he said, Caesar had his Brutus, Charles I had Cromwell. Clinton could profit from these examples if he crosses us. 1981 Hillary Clinton writes Jim McDougall, if Reaganomics works at all, Whitewater could become the Western Hemisphere's mecca. Major drug trafficker Barry Seal, under pressure from the Louisiana cops, relocates his operations to Mena, Arkansas. Seal is importing as much as 1,000 pounds of caution a month from Columbia according to Arkansas law enforcement officials. He will claim to have made more than $50 million out of his operations. As an informant, Seal testified that in 1981, before moving his operation to Arkansas, he made approximately 60 trips to Central America and brought back 18,000 kilograms. In 1996 the Progressive Review will report, the London Telegraph has obtained some of the first depositions in ex-CIA contract flyer Terry Reid's suit against Clinton's ex-security chief, and now a high-paid FEMA director, Buddy Young. According to the Telegraph's Ambrose Evans Pritchard, Larry Patterson, an Arkansas state trooper, testified under oath that there were large quantities of drugs being flown into the MENA airport, large quantities of money, large quantities of guns. The subject was discussed repeatedly in Clinton's presence by state troopers working on his security detail, he alleged. Patterson said the governor had very little comment to make, he was just listening to what was being said. Roger Morris and Sally Denton, Penthouse Magazine, Seal's legacy includes more than 2,000 newly discovered documents that now verify and quantify much of what previously had been only suspicion, conjecture, and legend. The documents confirm that from 1981 to his brutal death in 1986, Barry Seal carried on one of the most lucrative, extensive, and brazen operations in the history of the international drug trade, and that he did it with the evident complicity if not collusion, of elements of the United States government, apparently with the acquiescence of Ronald Reagan's administration, impunity from any subsequent exposure by George Bush's administration, and under the usually acute political nose of then-Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton. MENA State Police Investigator Russell Welch will later describe the airport, pointing to one hangar he says is owned by a man who doesn't exist in history back past a safe house in Baltimore in 1972. Another is owned by someone who smuggled heroin through Laos back in the 70s. Still another is owned by a guy who just went bankrupt. So what's he do? Flies to Europe for more money. Welch points to a half-dozen Fokker aircraft parked on an apron, noting that the DA's been tracking those planes back and forth to Colombia for a while now. 1982 A DA report uncovered by Ambrose Evans Pritchard will cite an informant claiming that a key Arkansas figure and backer of Clinton smuggles cocaine from Colombia, South America, inside race horses to hot springs. The London Telegraph's Ambrose Evans Pritchard writes, Basil Abbott, a convicted drug pilot, says that he flew a Cessna 210 full of cocaine into Mariana, in eastern Arkansas, in the spring of 1982. The aircraft was welcomed by an Arkansas state trooper in a marked police car. Arkansas was a very good place to load and unload he said. IRS agent William Duncan and an Arkansas State Police investigator take their evidence concerning drug trafficking in MENA to U.S. Attorney A.S.A. Hutchinson. They ask for 20 witnesses to be subpoenaed before the grand jury. Hutchinson chooses only three. According to reporter Mara Leverett, the three appeared before the grand jury, but afterwards, two of them also expressed surprise at how their questioning was handled. 1. A secretary at Rich Mountain Aviation had given Duncan sworn statements about money laundering at the company, transcripts of which Duncan had provided to Hutchinson. But when the woman left the jury room, she complained that Hutchinson had asked her nothing about the crime or the sworn statements she'd given to Duncan. As Duncan later testified, she basically said that she was allowed to give her name, address, position, and not much else. The other angry witness was a banker who had, in Duncan's words, provided a significant amount of evidence relating to the money laundering operation. According to Duncan, he, 
too, emerged from the jury room complaining that he was not allowed to provide the evidence that he wanted to provide to the grand jury. Roger Morse and Sally Denton, Penthouse Magazine, according to LRS criminal investigator Duncan, secretaries at the MENA airport told him that when CO flew into MENA, it there would be stacks of cash to be taken to the bank and laundered. One secretary told him that she was ordered to obtain numerous cashier's checks, each in an amount just under $10,000, at various banks in MENA and surrounding communities, to avoid filing the federal currency transaction reports required for all bank transactions that exceed that limit. Bank tellers testified before a federal grand jury that in November 1982, a Minan airport employee carried a suitcase containing more than $70,000 into a bank. The bank officer went down the teller lines handing out the stacks of $1,000 bills and got the cashier's checks. Law enforcement sources confirmed that hundreds of thousands of dollars were laundered from 1981 to 1983 just in a few small banks near Mina, and that millions more from SEAL's operation were laundered elsewhere in Arkansas and the nation. Bill Clinton wins back the governorship. Financial General changes its name to First American and Clark Clifford is appointed chairman. BCCI fronts begin acquiring controlling interest in banks and other American financial institutions. In Arkansas, Jim McDougal purchases Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. I. 1983. Mottoriati forms Lipo Finance and Investment in Little Rock. A non-citizen, Riotti hires Carter's former SBA director, Vernon Weaver, to chair the firm. The launch is accomplished with the aid of a $2 million loan guaranteed by the SBA. Weaver uses Governor Clinton as a character reference to help get the loan guarantee. First loan goes to Little Rock Chinese restaurant owner Charlie Try. In 1999, reported the Washington Post, Try, who had become a controversial fundraiser for President Clinton, entered into a plea agreement with the Justice Department yesterday winning leniency in exchange for telling all in an investigation of improper campaign contributions originating in China. State regulators warn Jim McDougall's Madison Guarantee S and L to stop making imprudent loans. Governor Clinton is also warned of the problem but takes no action. According to a later account in the Tampa Tribune, planes flying drugs into MENA in coolers marked medical supplies are met by several people close to then-Governor Bill Clinton. Although he is under investigation for drug activities, Dan Lasseter's firm is given a piece of 14 state bond issues. Judge David Hale's Capital Management Services starts making loans to state figures. David Hale is a former Arkansas municipal judge and former Arkansas banker. He worked with Jim McDougall on $3 million in loans from a lending company he ran. He pled guilty and went to jail for conspiring to defraud the Small Business Administration and looting the funds from a dummy business he established. As part of his guilty plea in looting money from an insurance company, he provided the allegations for the Whitewater scandal, and testimony for its investigators. Hale testified in U.S. District Court that Governor Bill Clinton pressured him to make a fraudulent $300,000 loan and that he not be named in the loan. Wiki 1984 Clinton backers Jack Stevens and mocked a Riotti by a banking firm and changed its name to Worthen Bank with Riotti's 28-year-old son James as president. Other Worth & Co. owners will eventually include BCCI investor Abdullah Taha Bakish. The Federal Home Loan Bank Board issues a negative report on Madison Guarantee, questioning both its lending practices and its financial stability. The Arkansas Securities Department begins to take steps to close it down. Starting in 1982 and operated by Jim McDougall Susan McDougall, Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan failed in the late 1980s. On April 14, 1997, Jim McDougall was convicted of 18 felony counts of fraud conspiracy charges. The counts had to do with bad loans made by Madison S. and L. This S. and L. was partnered with Whitewater Development Corporation, the subject of Whitewater Probe and owned, in part, by Bill and Hillary Clinton. Wikipedia Madison Garandy and McDougall hired Rose Law Firm where the Mrs. Clinton worked as a defense attorney. Mrs. Clinton's Rose Law Firm billing records on Madison Guarantee and McDougall's Castle Grant project that Hillary called IDC, Industrial Development Corporation. 
How much work she actually did on Madison and Castle Grand was the subject of the missing billing records. McDougall also held a fundraiser at Madison Garandy that paid off Clinton's campaign debt of $50,000. Madison Cashier's checks accounted for $12,000 of the funds raised. The Washington Times will later quote an unnamed Clinton business associate who claims the governor used to jog over to McDougall's office about once a month to pick up the retainer check for his wife. Jim McDougall will claim later that Clinton on one of his jogs had asked that Madison steer business to Hillary Clinton. Foreshadowing future Wall Street interest in Clinton, Goldman Sachs, Payne Weber, Salomon Brothers and Merrill Lynch all show up as financial backers of the governor. Also on the list, feature kingmaker Pam Harriman. But Bill Clinton's funders include not only some of the biggest corporate names ever to show an interest in the tiny state of Arkansas but some of the most questionable. A former U.S. attorney will later tell Roger Morris, that was the election when the mob really came into Arkansas politics. It wasn't just Bill Clinton and it went beyond our old Dixie Mafia. This was Eastern and West Coast crime money that noticed the possibilities just like the legitimate corporations did. Dan Lasseter buys a ski resort in New Mexico for $20 million and uses Clinton's name, with permission, to promote it. Later, a U.S. Customs investigative report will note that the resort is being used for drug operations and money laundering. Lasseter also flies to Belize with his aide Patsy Thomason to buy a 24,000-acre ranch. Among those present at the negotiations is the U.S. Ambassador. The deal falls through because of the opposition of the Belize government. A private contractor for Arkansas prison system stops selling prisoners' blood to a Canadian broker and elsewhere overseas after admitting the blood might be contaminated with the AIDS virus or hepatitis. Sales of prisoners' blood in U.S. are already forbidden. Contaminated blood will later become a big scandal in Canada. Tens of thousands of dollars in mysterious checks begin moving through Whitewater's account at Madison Garandy. Investigators will later suspect that McDougal was operating a check-hiding scheme to drain money from the S&L. Hot Springs Police Record Roger Clinton During a Cocaine Transaction Roger says, got to get some for my brother. He's got a nose like a vacuum cleaner. Roger is arrested while working at menial jobs for Arkansas bond daddy Dan Lassader. Barry Seal estimates that he has earned between $60 and $100 million smuggling cocaine into the U.S., but with the feds closing in on him, Barry Seal flies from Mena to Washington in his private Learjet to meet with two members of Vice President George Bush's drug task force. Following the meeting, Seal rolls over for the DEA, becoming an informant. He collects information on leaders of the Medellin cartel while still dealing in drugs himself. The deal will be kept secret from investigators working in Louisiana and Arkansas. According to reporter Mara Leverett, by Seal's own account, his gross income in the year and a half after he became an informant, while he was based at MENA and while A.S.A. Hutchinson was the federal prosecutor in Fort Smith, 82 miles away, was three quarters of a million dollars. Seal reported that $575,000 of that income had been derived from a single cocaine shipment which the DA had allowed him to keep. Breast further, he testified that, since going to work for the DEA, he had imported 1,500 pounds of cocaine into the U.S. Supposed informant seal will fly repeatedly to Colombia, Guatemala, and Panama, where he meets with Jorge Ochoa, Fabio Ochoa, Pablo Escobar, and Carlos Leder, leaders of the cartel that at the time controlled an estimated 80% of the cocaine entering the United States. Ronald Reagan wants to send the National Guard to Honduras to help in the war against the Sandinistas. Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis goes to the Supreme Court in a futile effort to stop it but Clinton is happy to oblige, even sending his own security chief, Buddy Young, along to keep an eye on things. Winding up its tour, the Arkansas Guard declares large quantities of its weapons excess and leaves them behind for the Contras. Clinton Bodyguard State Trooper L.D. Brown, applies for a CIA opening. Clinton gives him help on his application essay including making it more Reagan-esque on the topic of the Nicaragua. According to Brown, 
he meets a CIA recruiter in Dallas whom he later identities as former member of Vice President Bush's staff. On the recruiter's instruction, he meets with notorious drug dealer Barry Seal in a Little Rock restaurant. Joins Seal in flight to Honduras with a purported shipment of M16S and a return load of duffel bags. Brown gets $2,500 in small bills for the flight. Brown, concerned about the mission, consults with Clinton who says, Oh, you can handle it, don't sweat it. On second flight, Brown finds cocaine in a duffel bag and again he seeks Clinton's counsel. Clinton says to the conservative Brown, Your buddy, Bush, knows about it and, of the cocaine, that's Lassader's deal. Clinton wins re-election with 64% of the vote. 1985 Roger Clinton pleads guilty to cocaine distribution but cops a plea on more serious charges with a promise to cooperate. He will serve a short prison term. Mrs. Clinton is put on a $2,000 a month retainer by Madison Guarantee. Jim McDougall will later write in his book that the payments were in lieu of his earlier system of passing money to Bill Clinton. Miss Clinton will later claim not to have received any retainer nor to have been deeply involved with Madison. Subsequent records show, however, that she represented Madison before the state securities department. After the revelation, she says, for goodness sakes, you can't be a lawyer if you don't represent banks. Bill Clinton establishes the Arkansas Development Finance Authority that will be used, in the words of one well-connected Arkansan as his own political piggy bank. Though millions of dollars are funneled to Clinton allies, records of repayments will be hazy or non-existent. After brags to prospective out-of-state corporations of Arkansas anti-union climate, Dan Lassader is a major underwriter and gets a $30 million bond deal for state police radios even as the governor's stepbrother Roger is making a bargain with a U.S. attorney to testify against Lassader in a drug case. The New Jersey securities firm Bevel Bressler and Schulman files for bankruptcy amid fraud charges and an estimated $240 million in losses. One of the biggest apparent losers is Stevens Dominated Worthen Bank, which holds with Bevel $52 million of Arkansas state funds and uncollateralized repurchase agreements. Arkansas state pension funds, deposited in Worthen by Governor Bill Clinton, suddenly lose 15% of their value because of the failure of high risk short-term investments and the brokerage firm that bought them. The $52 million loss is covered by a worth in check written by Jack Stevens in the middle of the night, an insurance policy and the subsequent purchase over the next few months of 40% of the bank by Mokhtariati. Clinton and Worthen escape a major scandal. Lipo executive and Chinese native John Huang becomes active in Lipo's operations in Arkansas. China Resources pays for a LIPO organized trip to Asia by Governor Clinton, according to a later FBI interview with John Huang. Mokter and James Riotti engineer the takeover of the First National Bank of Mina in a town of 5,000 with few major assets beyond a Contra supply base, drug running and money laundering operations. Terry Reid is asked to take part in Operation Donation, under which planes and boats needed by the Contras disappear allowing owners to claim insurance. Reed has been a Contra operative and CIA asset working with Felix Rodriguez, the Contra linked to the CIA and then Vice President Bush's office. Reed later claims he refused, but that his plane was removed while he was away. Park on Meter, a parking meter manufacturer in Russellville, Arkansas, receives the first industrial development loan from the Arkansas Development Finance Authority in 1985. Some suspect that Palm is doing a lot more than making parking meters, specifically that it has secret federal contracts to make components of chemical and biological weapons and devices to carry them on C-130S for the Contras. The company later denies the Contra connection although it will admit having secret military contracts. Webb Hubble is the company's lawyer. Right next to Palm, on land previously owned by it, is an Army Reserve chemical warfare company. A series of checks to Clinton and his campaign are endorsed and deposited in Madison S. and L. One of the checks, a cashier's check in the amount of $3,000, has the name of a 24-year-old college student on it. When informed of this in 1993, the then-student, Ken Peacock, will deny having made any such donation. 
Whitewater fails to file corporate tax returns for this year. ASA Hutchinson leaves the U.S. Attorney's Office to make an unsuccessful bid for U.S. Senate. According to police sources, Hutchinson had been aware of what was happening at MENA and the investigation into it, but did nothing. Hutchinson is replaced by Mike Fitzhugh who is reluctant to let investigators Russell Welch of the state police and William Duncan of the IRS present evidence of money laundering to a grand jury. Jim McDougal sets up a late controversial land deal called Castle Grand. According to Ambrose Evans Pritchard, on June 4, 1985, the diary of Arkansas State Police Lt. Russell Welch says that an agent from the DEA informed me in strictest confidence that it was believed, within his department, that, major drug transporter, Barry Seal is flying weapons to Central and South America. In return he is allowed to smuggle what he wanted back into the United States. 1986 Journalist Evans Pritchard will describe the Arkansas of this period as a major point for the transshipment of drugs and perilously close to becoming a narco republic, a sort of mini Colombia within the borders of the United States. There is an epidemic of cocaine, contaminating the political establishment from top to bottom, with parties at which cocaine would be served like hors d'oeuvres and sex was rampant. Clinton attends some of these events. According to former CIA officials David McMichael and Ray McGovern, Barry Seal, a former TWA pilot who had trained Nicaraguan Contra pilots in the early 80s, and who is facing a long sentence after a federal drug conviction in Florida, makes his way to the White House's National Security Council to make the following proposition to officials there. He would fly his own plane to Colombia and take delivery of cocaine. He would then make an emergency landing in Nicaragua and make it appear that Sandinista officials were aiding him in drug trafficking. SEAL made it clear that he would expect help with his legal problems. The Reagan White House jumps at the offer. SEAL's plane is flown to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where it was fitted with secret cameras to enable SEAL to photograph Nicaraguan officials in the act of assisting him with the boxes of cocaine. On January 17, the U.S. Attorney for the Western District drops the money laundering and narcotics conspiracy charges against associates of drug smuggler Barry Seal over the protest of investigators Russell Welch of the State Police and Bill Duncan of the Internal Revenue. In a letter to U.S. Attorney General Edwin Meese the Louisiana Attorney General wrote, Barry Seal smuggled between $3 billion and $5 billion of drugs into the U.S. The operation goes as planned. The photos are delivered to the White House, and a triumphant Ronald Reagan goes on national TV to show that the Sandinistas are not only communists but also criminals intent on addicting America's youth. A Federal Home Loan Bank Board audit describes Madison as financially reckless, rife with conflicts and on the brink of collapse. It says that the S&L's records are so poor that examiners often could not discover the real nature of transactions. In August federal regulators will remove McDougal from the board of Madison. Capital Management Services Inc., owned by David Hale, makes an SBA-approved loan of $300,000 to Susan McDougal, sole owner of an advertising firm called Master Marketing. The loan will never be repaid. Hale will later claim that Clinton and Jim McDougal pressured him into making the loan. Dan Lassader, Arkansas bond Don who is close to Clinton, pleads guilty to cocaine distribution charges. The case also involves Clinton's stepbrother Roger, who testifies against Lassader in a plea agreement. Both Lassader and Roger Clinton will serve brief prison terms. While Lassader is in prison his affairs will be run by Patsy Thomason, who later becomes a White House aide. Seal is scheduled to testify at the trial of Jorge Ochoa Vasquez. But on February 19, shortly before the trial is to begin, Seal is murdered in Baton Rouge Yangland style by three Colombian hitmen armed with machine guns who attack while he's seated behind the wheel of his white Cadillac in Baton Rouge, La. The Colombians, connected with the Medellin drug cartel, are tried and convicted. Upon hearing of Seal's murder, one DA agent says, there was a contract out on him, and everyone knew it. He was to have been a crucial witness in the biggest case in DA history. According to the London Telegraph Sombros Evans Pritchard, Seal was probably the biggest importer of cocaine in American history. 
between 1980 and his assassination in 1986, his team of pilots smuggled in 36 metric tons of cocaine, 104 tons of marijuana and 3 tons of heroin, according to a close associate of SEAL. The sums of money involved were staggering. At his death, SEAL left a number of operational bank accounts. One of them, at the Cayman Islands branch of the Fuji Bank, currently has an interest earning balance of $1,645,433,000. Roger Morris and Sally Denton, Penthouse Magazine SEAL himself spent considerable sums to land, base, maintain, and specially equip or refit his aircraft for smuggling. According to personal and business records, he had extensive associations at MENA and in Little Rock, and was in nearly constant telephone contact with MENA when he was not there himself. Phone records indicate SEAL made repeated calls to MENA the day before his murder. This was long after SEAL, according to his own testimony, was working as an $800,000 a year informant for the federal government. Eight months after the murder, SEAL's cargo plane is shot down over Nicaragua. It is carrying ammunition and other supplies for the Contras from MENA. One crew member, Eugene Hazenfuss, survives. Roger Morris and Sally Denton, Penthouse Magazine, tax records show that, having assessed SEAL posthumously for some $86 million in back taxes on his earnings from MENA and elsewhere between 1981 and 1983, even the LRS forgave the taxes on hundreds of millions in known drug and gun profits over the ensuing two-year period when SEAL was officially admitted to be employed by the government. Roger Morris and Sally Denton, Penthouse Magazine, Arkansas State Trooper Larry Patterson, would later testify, under oath, according to the London Sunday Telegraph, that he and other officers discussed repeatedly in Clinton's presence the large quantities of drugs being flown into the MENA airport large quantities of money, large quantities of guns, indicating that Clinton may have known much more about SEAL's activities than he has admitted. Whitewater fails to file corporate tax returns for this year. James Riotti resigns as president of Worth and Bank. Clinton is re-elected governor. Roger Clinton is paroled. 1987. According to the McDougals, the Whitewater files are transferred to the Clintons. In the 1992 campaign, the Clintons will say they cannot find the records. Clinton gives Arkansas Traveler awards to Contra operatives Adolfo and Mario Calero and John Singh Lab. According to Ambrose Evans Pritchard of the London Telegraph, on August 1987 Arkansas Police Lt. Russell Welch receives a secret teletype from the FBI office in Chicago advising him that a CIA or DA operation is taking place at the MENA airport. The Sunday Telegraph has a copy of the telex. In late 1987, Welch writes in his diary, I feel like I live in Russia, waiting for the secret police to pounce down. A government has gotten out of control. Men find themselves in positions of power and suddenly crimes become legal. National security? Two boys, Kevin Ives and Don Henry are killed in Saline County and left on a railroad track to be run over by a train the medical examiner will initially rule the deaths accidental, saying that the boys were unconscious and in a deep sleep due to marijuana. The finding will be punctured by dogged investigators whose efforts are repeatedly blocked by law enforcement officials. Ultimately, the bodies will be exhumed and another autopsy will be performed, which finds that Henry had been stabbed in the back and Ives beaten with a rifle butt. Although no one will ever be charged, the trail will lead into the penumbra of the Dixie Mafia and the Arkansas political machine. Some believe the boys died because they accidentally intercepted a drug drop, but other information obtained by the Progressive Review suggests the drop may have dispensed not drugs but cash, gold and platinum, part of a series of sorties through which those working with U.S. intelligence were being reimbursed. According to one verse, 